In this lecture, we'll trace the emergence of Black theology within the disciplinary framework of academic theology, as well as within the wider scene of America's struggle for racial justice. This discussion follows our earlier focus on history in the United States through the lens of coloniality, an economy of enslavement, and the dynamic 19th century. We might begin our focus in this session with the recognition that Black theology as a practice took root within those earlier eras. Whenever persons named by America's racial project as Black thought theologically and expressed insights about humanity's relationship to God, that was, in a sense, a form of doing Black theology. And in this way, the very earliest moments of American history is a moment in which we can see Black theology in poetry, in sermon, in song, in diaries, in speeches, and more. As we focus on Black theology as a discipline within the academic setting, we want always to ask what new tools of scholarship help us to unearth those voices from those earlier eras and to think with that more wide ranging understanding of Black theology. But as we move to think through the more formal expression of Black theology as a discipline, we want to trace the experiences from out of what is known as the Black church tradition. The Black church tradition in the United States begins in relation to the racial projects of whiteness in any number of ways. When white denominations created missions to serve explicitly African American populations, that could be one root of the emergence of the Black church. But it also happened when Black Christians split from white Christian denominations and when white Christians refused integration and black churches emerged. And so the emergence of the black church in US history is an expression of both independence and a rejection of, in many cases, the ways in which white Christian churches continued to harbor practices of discrimination and practices of white supremacy. As we move into the era of emancipation and the expressions of the black church, we want to also continue to recognize that systems of white uh, power and systems of white legislation continue to impact black Christians in this nation. So even as we're thinking about the emergence of the black church as an independent uh, arm of Christianity in this country. We want to be thinking about this in a broader horizon of continued control that was dominated by white legislators and white power holders. Those Black Christians who gained their citizenship with emancipation now could access the full rights and privileges of being a citizen. But in the era of Jim Crow, these full rights were regularly compromised. Recall that in 1862, the Morrill Land Grant Act established public universities for the education of citizens. And this is, an, this is an example of the kinds of opportunities that would be made available to Black Christians in that era after emancipation. When Black Christians as citizens now had access to the full rights of citizenship, including, including education. We might feel the experience of emerging out of emancipation with the Civil Rights Act that we know was passed in 1875 by a new Congress in the process of reconstruction. But that same Civil Rights Act that defended the full rights of citizenship, regardless of previous state of enslavement, was then overturned in 1883. So this sense that the rights granted by emancipation and the rights granted through legislation could, could also be taken away through new legislation is a key feature of the experience of Black Christians in this era. So while we have the first moral act establishing universities and emancipation and the granting of citizenship allowing Black Christians to attend those public universities, in 1890, a second moral act was established that essentially created separate but equal. 
in the same legislation that said no money should be paid under this act for a state or territory to support a college where a distinction of race or color was made. So uh, uh, a, an act of legislation that put an end to discrimination in terms of the admission of students, except the act read, when there is the establish and establishment and maintenance of such colleges separately for white and colored students. And this would be held to be in compliance with the provisions of this act. And so by the same legislation that, that insists on the full access for black college students, that same act uh, put into place the possibility of the establishment by the state of a separate but equal accommodation in education. So I'll just return to this map here and you can access this online in order to see the way that those universities uh, granted by the Morrill Land Grant Act in 1862 were established across the nation, but then after the full rights and citizenship was made available to black citizens, in 1890, this second act in many states created separate but equal colleges and universities. So while we think about this era as an era that affords rights, we see also the, the rewriting of legislation so that those rights are, are often compromised for black citizens. We think about separate but equal here, not only in terms of legislation with respect to education, but this is the same era of the legislation with respect to the system of transportation, which is the well-known Plessy versus Ferguson of 1896. So this sense that emancipation provides real rights of citizens, but that those rights could be legislatively compromised perfectly legal discriminations written into our systems of education, our systems of transportation, and the many and various laws governing social interaction. We can't forget that these acts of legislation, the acts that governed the possibility for full rights and citizenship, were being brought to the court system by efforts of African Americans who were seeking their full rights as citizens, and the painstaking work that would go into Plessy versus Ferguson and other challenges to the practices uh, of exclusion. Denying full access to parks and books and libraries and textbooks and even circus tickets help us to see the ways in which laws during this period were governing both access to the benefits of citizenship and access to the, in ways that govern social interaction as well. It shouldn't be lost on us as students of history that the naming of these laws was a shorthand. The shorthand naming of these laws was, a, was as Jim Crow laws. And this was a reference to that caricature in white popular culture of a poor man, a poor black man by the same name. So the sense in which this era, the visions of popular culture, the enact enactment of legislation and the restriction of opportunities for emancipated persons was a real pressure on those black Christians of this era not only uh, access to education and access in, in systems of transportation and social interactions, but also the very intimate and economic realities of marriage, as these state laws describe a prohibiting of intermarriage on the basis of the, the constructed racial categories of this era's racial moment. Many commentators will describe the establishment of these perfectly legal exclusionary systems as an impetus for the great migration by which black Southerners moved to other locations for the opportunities that they might afford. Securing the rights afforded to citizens of this nation remained a difficult reality throughout the late 19th century and into the 20th century not only by systems that were in place legally, but also the extra legal violence uh, 
and the extrajudicial lynchings by uh, and the means by which a racist racial project of white supremacy was enforced. So while all of these legal systems are put in place and some unwritten systems put in place to maintain white control in many areas of this nation, violence was a means by which many within these racial projects uh, maintained white control. As African Americans stepped into their rights as citizens, building wealth, securing jobs, enjoying public recreation, white mobs often responded with what history has named as race riots in Tulsa, in Chicago, in Omaha, where we see white mobs enact their form of extra legal violence to maintain control. Recognition of this and resistance to this mob violence and the lynchings throughout this era, era were woven into song in expressions like Billie Holiday's Strange Fruit. James Cone, a theologian of uh, the, uh, as, and a founder among the disciplinary project of black theology, wrote in his 2011 Cross and the Lynching Tree, a description of this mob violence that we see enacted by white Christians across the nation. He writes that the claim that whites had the right to control the black population through lynching and other extra legal forms of mob violence was grounded in the religious belief that America is a white nation called by God to bear witness to the superiority of white over black. Cone describes it was the moral and Christian responsibility of white men to protect the purity of their race by any means necessary. Cone's work helps us to return to these images of lynchings and these images of mob violence and to recognize that at this time, those mobs that were enacting that violence would have been made up of whites who identified as Christian. It's also during this period that Black Americans organized in the in writing in publication and on the streets their public resistance to white violence it's worth pausing just a minute here in order to see what we also have access to in this era that is we have the uh footage of some of these uh, demonstrations. And we certainly have the writings from this era and the anti-lynching, uh, um, not only the demonstrations, but the publications that were drawing attention to this injustice. So it's worth, uh, since we have access to these visuals, it's worth seeing the way in which those uh, were not only enacted, but that they were also uh, distributed with new technologies. So we might return to our overarching historical survey here, and we might pause to recognize this moment and ask whether and how it has been part of our own introduction to this era of history. We might also vision the leading figures of the mid 20th century civil rights era emerging from out of this era of sustained violence in response to uh, the advancements of African Americans in this nation. We might vision the leading figures of the civil rights era involved in the heritage of this experience of white terror in the early 20th century. <laughs> 
Malcolm X's father in his own description, uh, the experience of his father being targeted by a white hate group who set his childhood home on fire was among those experiences that would go on to uh, shape Malcolm X, Malcolm X, Malcolm X's own activism. Martin Luther King Jr., his father also witnessed a lynching. And even while going on to become a successful businessman and pastor, um, King's father carried that experience with him and passed that on in the activism of his son. But the violence that was enacted in this era was not only the mob violence or the visual violence that we can see, it was also an institutional or a structural violence as well. And we can see this era of structural violence as the nation as a whole attempts to recover from the Great Depression. The nation as a whole is suffering and the nation as a whole presents legislation that would help citizens move through this period of suffering and rebuild after the Great De Depression. We see, however, a legalized violence in this era in which systems that secure the well being for citizens were written in such a way as to privilege the citizenship of those who were identified as white. Two major pieces of legislation in this era are worth visiting and revisiting and recognizing the way in which the law was written and then enacted to the benefit of white citizens and the detriment of, of black citizens and other citizens of color. While the Federal Housing Administration creates the opportunity for future generations of Americans to make their way through economic difficulties like the Great Depression by putting into place legislation that would provide a security in home ownership. The underwriting manual that was used in this era created a system by which those resources that would be dedicated to housing were enacted in such a way that they prioritized white citizens and kept those uh, from citizens of color. So that something like the underwriting manual that says, if a neighborhood is to retain stability, it's necessary that properties shall continue to be occupied by the same social and racial classes. There was a hierarchy that was put in place within the mortgage underwriting manual asking that, that those within the system of uh, underwriting mortgages would abide by this racial classification that was reflecting the impact of race on land values. So the, the wording of the manual that would direct those government sponsored funds into the hands of future home ownership was written by, uh, the, the, the background was written by a, uh, an economist from the University of Chicago, Homer Hoyt. And in the manual for lending, it simply read that the classification that follows may be scientifically misleading from a standpoint of inherent racial characteristics, but Mr. Hoyt avers that it registers an opinion or prejudice that is reflected in land values. This idea here that a racial project could impact land values and be reflected in those land values is what we see in this underwriting manual. It goes on to say in the manual, likewise, it represents the ranking of races and nationalities with respect to the beneficial effects on land values. Those nationalities and races having the most favorable influence come first in the list and those exerting detrimental effects come last. 
So you might just think back to Omi and Wynant's description of a racial project. It's first the creation of the categories of the races, as you can see here on this list, the various categories of racial uh, uh, identities that the study would bring forward the creation of these racial categories, and then sorting persons into them, and then dedicating the benefits or the deficits on the basis of that. And we see this so clearly in the description that, that uh, accompanies this racial hierarchy. This is the hierarchy of the, racial, the races in this era's racial project, and those races that are deemed most favorable will be granted access to those governmental resources that will allow for home ownership. And of course, those that are deemed detrimental to land values will not be uh, guaranteed those same government funds. And this was then the underwriting manual that helps us to understand what was taking place in this era of both redlining and restrictive covenants because the banks and the insurance companies could use these uh, uh, um, industry generated maps. So the, the banking system was using these maps that were generated and the insurance uh, companies were using these maps that were generated by the, by the industry. And private citizens could also put into place restrictive covenants on the basis of this, a restrictive covenant that would say that this property can never be sold to anyone other than uh, the language that was used, the, the race that it was intended for. So that the racial project actually impacts the material well-being of citizens in very differential ways. And again, you can access these maps interactively on the website Mapping Inequality, and you can see things like the very sheets that were used within this industry and the very sheets by which individuals would go out and assess the communities in order to create the maps. And in that assessment, the lines that were used to describe and to ask how many foreign families are in this neighborhood how many, what kinds of nationalities, what's the percentage of the category that has been named Negro, and what kind of shifting or infiltration is taking place in this neighborhood. So when we're thinking about any given era's racial project, we have to think about uh, the ways in which the categories of the races are constructed. But then we have to think about all the different ways that the benefits are uh, withheld or distributed within each era. How many people went into this era's racial project only through the lens of the mortgage lending industry or the insurance industry or neighborhood associations? all the many different individuals in addition to legislators who were part of the construction and the maintenance of this era's racial project. This era's racial project also in terms of legislation that was significant in this era could be, uh, this, this era's racial project could impact legislation without ever naming race as a feature. While we have the races listed in the racial project surrounding and impacting home ownership, there isn't even the naming of the races in the Social Security Act, but the legislators who designed this act and the impact of this act had a racial project clearly in view. When the Social Security Act was written in order to support, again, uh, uh, the, the, the citizenry in terms of offering social safety nets, the sense in which uh, this was for the protection of white citizens in particular was in fact reflected in uh, the choices that were made about the kind of employment that was covered under the Social Security Act. And so when legislation is written without any description of race, but written to, to discount or to uh, exclude agricultural labor, 
domestic service in a private home and casual labor not in the course of the employer's trade or business. Each of these categories were categories that were dominated by African Americans and, and other people of color in this era, making it so that 65% of African Americans were ineligible to receive Social Security. So the ways in which legislation in this period uh, was the silent form of violence and economic violence to um, those who were moving into the full rights of citizenship is a reality that we have to keep in view as we're thinking about the emergence of the civil rights era in the middle of the 20th century. We have the promise of citizenship, we have the promise of full rights of citizenship, and then we have legislation that pulls back on those full rights, and we have violence that maintains that system of, of, of segregation and that system of differential access. But we also have in this era, the access that is afforded and the development of scholars within institutions that were predominantly white institutions, institutions of higher learning that do afford the development of a new discipline that will become known as black theology. And we might turn to someone like Howard Thurman, who was teaching at Boston University in the middle of the 20th century and who was a mentor to Martin Luther King when he was a student at Boston University. And Howard Thurman's, uh, his training as a biblical scholar and an ethicist and a theologian allowed him to ask new questions within the discipline. And he asked quite simply, what difference does it make if we read the biblical text, if we view the story of Jesus through the lens of the disinherited? And he asked simply, what does Jesus have to say to those whose backs are against the wall? This foundational question that spurred the emergence of black theology what difference does it make if we read the biblical text, if we engage the Christian tradition, not from the position of those in power, but from the position of those whose backs are against the wall. But of course, in this era, we have the continued struggle for racial justice. The movements and the uh, rights that are gained and the ongoing uh, struggle for full access that emerges in this period precisely around education and housing and home ownership also saw uh, the, the uh, ongoing resistance to that integration and the use of the biblical text in many different ways uh, to claim even all the way through the 20th century, that the biblical uh, text um, denounces integration. So the ways in which the Bible could be used uh, run all the way through this era's racial project of, of both um, expanding rights and uh, denying rights. And in this case, uh, uh, footage of protesters against desegregation, against integration uh, and the desegregation of schools cited the book of numbers the lord commands that the tribes not be mingled and so this question of how is scripture being used in this era an era that did see advances and critical advances with with something like brown versus board of education but simultaneously, we see the emergence of separate school systems now for white Christians and the pattern of the establishment of faith-based schools that could be outside the legal requirements of integration is something that is, uh, needs to be part of our attention in this era as well. So while we have the emergence of uh, opportunities for African-Americans in this period, uh, 
We can also see systems of control that are put, put in place both silently and explicitly. And that those systems of control might also have impacted the kinds of education and the kinds of theological knowledge that were being produced at this time. In this era, we want to be moving ever closer to uh, the civil rights era and the emergence of a black theology in a formal way, which doesn't really come until the end of uh, the, the civil rights era and into the last quarter of the 20th century. So up until this point, we have the roots of black theology, we have the roots of uh, what is the experience in the black, of the black church, giving voice to uh, the, the uh, emergence of a black theology, but we don't yet have black theology as a formal discipline within the academic setting of theology. What we have at this point in our chronological exploration is the building experience of African Americans being promised full rights of citizenship and those promises, those promises being regularly denied. We have activism in many forms across the nation and throughout this whole era uh, in uh, enacting the rights of citizenship. And we have increasing and, and regular violence in response to those claims for full rights and citizenship. The experience of the nation in the, in the brutal death of the teenager Emmett Till in the middle of the 20th century was one of the catalysts that, that brought together both the, uh, the energy of the middle mid-century uh, civil rights movement and the energy of the emerging uh, black theology movement. Activists, theologians, and others will describe this murder as the galvanizing moment of the 20th century in the emergence of the civil rights movement. Emmett Till, a teenager who was visiting his extended family, a teenager from Chicago who was visiting his extended family in uh, the South and who was brutally murdered, his mother making the decision that she would not let this go unnoticed, but that she would publicly uh, uh, share the images of her disfigured son. In his later uh, book, The Cross and the Lynching Tree, James Cone, one of the fathers of black theology, describes this moment as a moment in which the crucified Christ was revealed and, and the spirit of Christ formed a, a power within the civil rights movement, reading this moment, in fact, theologically as a form of black theological expression. This was the era that galvanized activists like Rosa Parks and Medgar Evers in the varieties of ways that uh, black citizens were already mobilizing for their rights that had been, uh, that had been compromised and refused them. This is the era in which students mobilized in, in response to the, the wide variety of practices that kept black and white separate. And this is the era that Martin Luther King Jr. was called from out of his uh, emergence as uh, a, a doctor of theology with his PhD from Boston University and called into a role as a pastor and then called into a movement already in progress, a movement of civil rights that was happening uh, in many places across the South. And so Martin Luther King had a decision. Would he continue to pastor in a way that didn't join that movement of African-American citizens? 
would he pastor in such a way that relied on primarily the training of academic theology, or would he mobilize his training in black the in, in academic theology to be a voice of the people who were already involved in this struggle uh, for uh, justice and struggle for their rights. What we find in this era is that the site of the Black church was not only a site for uh, autonomy and escape from the structures of uh, white society and white supremacy in many places around the nation, that the Black church not only functioned as a site of autonomy within that broader frame, it also served as a communal site for organizing. And so the 16th Street Baptist Church in Birmingham was a location for the Birmingham uh, uh, activism that would, uh, that would bring people together and resist the kind of legislation that was keeping African Americans from their full rights of citizenship in this location. And it's because of that location, that location of autonomy, that location of organizing, that the bombing of the 16th Street Baptist Church is especially potent as a reminder of those ways in which white violence, what would take on any form in order to stop this movement. September 1963, the bombing of the 16th Street uh, Baptist Church killed four young girls and this uh, renewed sense that the civil rights movement needed to step up and respond not only to the claims for full rights, but step up and respond to the regular and relenting systems of white violence. It's really in this era that perhaps we see the difference uh, striking between the figures of Malcolm X and Martin Luther King in their response to this violence. Because it's in this moment that Malcolm X, we can see, has emerged as a figure from out of Christian tradition and shaped by Christian tradition, but finally arriving at the place of rejecting scripture as white man's religion and refusing to participate in those practices that would allow for white control and white violence to continue. Whereas in the same era of response to the violence at, uh, of the bombing uh, and, the, and the murder of the four young girls, Martin Luther King stepped up his efforts to utilize scripture to mobilize black and white together. Malcolm X was rooted in the black church tradition and was raised with a relationship to the biblical text. During his earlier time in prison in the 1940s to 1952, he spent time engaged with the biblical text, but found that there was an opportunity to uh, open his own religious horizon as he learned the tradition also of Islam. But while he's in prison, we can see the way in which the biblical text did provide an opportunity for thinking through the realities that he experienced in this era. He writes in his letters from prison about his reading the Bible continuously and seeing new things in that biblical text. His thinking with the Psalms and the, and the, and the writings of lament. How long, O oh Lord, until are you, you uh, support right, the just and rescue the weak and needy? But, uh, Malcolm X, his experience in the wider Christian nation was one that finally uh, uh, saw him rejecting Christianity as the white man's religion. 
And in some of his writings into the 60s, he, we hear the way in which some of the reasoning for naming Christianity in this way has resonance with what we have already seen with Frederick Douglass and the kinds of Christianity that were being encountered in this long struggle for racial justice. Malcolm X wrote that Christianity is the white man's religion, the Holy Bible in the white man's hands, and his interpretations of it have been the greatest single ideological weapon for enslaving millions of non-white human beings, end quote. And our earlier studies of coloniality and the era of an economy of enslavement and even into uh, the dynamic 19th century we have to see the truth in what Malcolm X, his insight uh, captures in that description. He writes in another, in another place, the, in the end of White World Supremacy, which was published in 1971, he describes a white Jesus, a white virgin, white angels, white everything, but a black devil, of course. And we might be reminded of the encounter with Immanuel Kant from the uh, earlier eras and the ways in which a racial project and a religio racial project might bear those traces of an assumed whiteness. So Malcolm Little converts to the tradition of Islam and becomes Malcolm X simultaneously an embrace of an alternative religious, uh, um, uh, sorry, simultaneously the embrace of an alternative religious scripture in his engagement with the Quran and in his uh, experience with the nation of Islam. Martin Luther King in this same era is reflecting on the whiteness of Jesus, of the Jesus that he has also encountered in the white and black Christianity of his era. But to Martin Luther King, the whiteness of Jesus's skin in the way that King even imagined it was of no consequence. He says, the color of Jesus's skin is of little or no consequence. The whiteness or blackness of one's skin is a biological quality which has nothing to do with the intrinsic value of the personality. The significance of Jesus lay not in his color, but in his unique God consciousness and his willingness to surrender his will to God's will. He was the son of God, not because of his external biologicalness, but because his internal spiritual commitment. He would have been no more significant if his skin had been black. He is no less significant because his skin was white. You might listen here to the way in which King adopts a white Jesus and then follows up with the idea that his whiteness is not significant. But you might pay attention to the way that the emergent black theology that follows King and that follows the critique of Malcolm X has something different to say about who Jesus was in light of the era's racial project. So something like Galatians 3.28, was a passage in scripture that was a grounding point for Martin Luther King. Neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, neither male or, or female, you are all one in Christ Jesus, where black theology might, might adopt a similar orientation, but see Jesus in perhaps a different way. When you listen to King's speeches, you might hear those resonance that we have seen in earlier eras, those places in the biblical text that have been particularly uh, informative to the theology of the Black church. And you will hear King use Exodus. You will hear him weave within his public speeches the figures from that story, 
you will hear him weave together the story of the people in the present era with that promise that God had spoken to Moses. And so as you're listening to his speeches and as you hear him in his, uh, his speech, I've been to the mountaintop, you might just revisit that biblical text of Exodus and hear those strands uh, coming through. But this era also, as we continue through the civil rights expressions, this era also was both the advancement of rights through the civil rights era, advancement of, uh, of new legislation from out of the activism of uh, both King and Malcolm X, but it was also a continued uh, era of violence directed legislatively and violence directed through legal forms, violence on African-Americans in this nation. And so the various uh, uh, way, the various um, uh, movements and the various expressions and uprising against systemic violence and police violence uh, that ran through the 1960s, Harlem in 1964, Los Angeles in 1965, Detroit in 1967. It's from out of this complex, many faceted uh, forms of experience of African-American Christians in this nation that black theology as a discipline finally emerges. The foundational requirement of access to the education that will allow for academic uh, production and academic credentialing and academic public publications were finally in place for another generation of scholars to emerge. The activism that laid the foundation of the insights that would come from Black theology was fully in place and fully across the nation itself. And the continued expression of white violence and the continued expression of white control, not only in legislation and in society, but beginning to be recognized even within the discipline of theology. And this is the, the, the space from out of which black theology emerges. As James Cohn is a young scholar at this time and he's listening in on the struggles in the streets and the black power movement and the emergence of the Black Panthers as a party and the continued repression by white systems of power to afford the full rights of citizenship. It's in this era, an era in which legislation in education and housing and employment and transportation and social uh, uh, expression all of these systems that continued to be in place that compromised the full flourishing of African Americans as citizens, those same realities that are only now finally being addressed in the legislation of HR 40. It's this full range of history that is in place for the emergence of both the Black Power Movement and Black theology as a discipline. It's in this era that theologians are trained in those systems of education and in the experiences of the Black community, grounded in the Black church tradition and, and, uh, in, and um, embracing the power of the Black power movement something like Albert Clegg's Black Messiah on the religious roots of Black power, a strong and uncompromising presentation by America's most influential and controversial Black religious leader. This sense in which theologians who might listen in on and be attentive to and think from the perspective of those Black Americans who were uh, who were uh, advocating for their rights, 
grounded in a religious expression, that that could be controversial was uh, the theme of this era, a black power Christianity and a black Messiah. This, these are the same themes that emerge in the writings of James Cone, a young theologian who uh, has his first academic position at a college outside Detroit and is present for the Detroit uprisings of 1967 and is listening in on the activism and the pastoring and the academic work of Albert Clegg. And James Cone brings forward then black theology and black power as a document that saw God at work in the world in the black power movement and also brought forth very soon after uh, a black theology of liberation that read the liberatory movements of his day through the lens of systematic theology and asked the question, where is God at work? Where is Jesus at work? And what is the salvation and liberation that this movement is going to bring? So as you read James Cone, and his work is easily accessible and available uh, now as a staple within theological uh, exploration. As you read James Cone, you might listen in for his Christology his vision of God and his understanding of the person of Jesus Christ, which he says is at the center of every Christian's faith, but which looks differently when read through the lens of the Black experience. As Black theology emerged as a discipline, more and more scholars continued the paths that were laid down by Cone, by Clegg, by Howard Thurman before them, and by the countless back Black Christians before them as well. And as Black theology takes root within the discipline of academic theology, new sets of questions are asked to the discipline of theology itself. As Randall Bailey describes, Black theologians began to question the very hermeneutical practices of white biblical theologies that had de-Africanized the Bible. The practices of scriptural interpretation, Bailey describes, were centered in white European frames and tended to read African presence out of the biblical text. A white hermeneutic had de-Africanized the very biblical text that stood in front of them, misrepresenting the peoples of Ethiopia or the Kushite or Egyptian empires. White theology, white biblical scholarship misread those nations as unconnected with African geography and African nations. Interpretive practices that presumed white supremacies infected even the most prestigious biblical scholarship in Bailey's view. And so as we're thinking about the, the resources and practices that continue to build black theology, the very, the very resources of academic theological uh, interpretation and academic biblical uh, tools of scholarship, could be used in new ways when taking into account uh, the, the destabilization of a white hermeneutic and a white racial frame. As the traditions of Black theology continued and expanded, the experience of women in Black theological traditions and women within the traditions of struggle in uh, the, the United States also came to be woven into the works that were produced in, at this time. So as you read a text like Dolores Williams' Sisters in the Wilderness, we hear her reclaiming Black women's history and the story from the biblical text of Hagar, an enslaved woman, as resources for theological thinking and theological activism. As she does, she revisions a God 
not exclusively a God of white Christians, not exclusively a God who is liberator, but a God who accompanies those who struggle in their very survival. So as you listen to the speeches by Martin Luther King and Malcolm X, you might hear especially the ways in which biblical stories are woven or rejected within their speaking. As you read the Black theologies of James Cone and Dolores Williams, you can see similarities in their interpretations, but you also have to see the differences. So when we think about Black theology, we have to recognize both some features of a shared experience, but we also have to recognize the internal diversities, diversities that learned from and thought with Christian scriptural texts and traditions from Islam and the Quranic text. We have to think about experiences of women and men of biblical scholars and untrained, uh, academically untrained theologians as part of what goes into this broader vision of black theology. The traditions of black theology are a study in their own right, and they are essential to thinking about the emergence of a theological tradition that places racial justice at its center. I'd also like to close with the recommendation that you listen in on some of the constructive work being done in Black Christian congregations and strategies that might continue to resist the coloniality that we can trace in white Christian American theologies. For this session here, I'll recommend that you uh, view uh, the Requiem for Ahmaud Arbery entitled The Cross and the Lynching Tree that was presented by the Reverend Dr. Otis Moss III at Trinity United Church of Christ in Chicago. And I'll close our session together with just a piece from a very recent service that he and his congregation um, uh, put together as a witness to how Christian, uh, Black Christian theology continues to emerge in our moment. We, the people of African descent, have a greater story than the one told to you by schools designed to train but not educate. We, the people of African descent, have a history older than this republic. Our history does not begin in sleep, but was birthed the moment God crafted you and released holy breath in Adam and Eve. Our history is the story of Abraham, Sarah, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, Deborah, David, Solomon, Jesus, and Paul. Our history spans Kemet, Ethiopia, Egypt, Cush, Carthage, Cyrene, Hippo, and Alexandria. We are the Moors. We are the Persians. We are the Canaanites. We are the Byzantine Empire, the Ghanaians, Mali, and Sonheim. We carve the commandments of God from the mountain, hid Jesus in Africa, journeyed across Rome to spread the gospel, protected Muhammad's people when they sought refuge in Ethiopia, plotted as maroons in the mountains of Jamaica, created rhythms in Cuba, composed the sounds of Louisiana, and wrote the poetry in Arnold. We, the people of Africans, are the Jews, the Muslims, and the Christian. We established the Abrahamic faith and dared rewrite the Protestant tradition through William C. We, the people of African descent, came through the lava, and this is our story. You can view the entire. I will bless the Lord at all times. God's praise shall continually be in my mouth. Guess what? It is my offer time. <laughs>
and we welcome you to Trinity United Church of Christ. This is our Black History Celebration. I guarantee you, you will be blessed today. It is an extraordinary worship experience that is going to inspire you and educate you. Now,